Lord, as we gather in the name of your son, we thank you for the promise of his presence. That when we gather in his name, he is here. Oh Lord, open our hearts and our minds to you, to your presence, to your word, to that which you wish to both work in us and through us. And so we yield to your authority and say, speak to us, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I have to tell you, in looking at the lessons as we give thanks today on the eve of the celebration of James the Just, that you could either go, well, you know, you can go in a bunch of different directions when you start thinking about the scriptures. And there is a kind of tension, and appropriately so, between, in essence, the inside baseball story, which is about James, in essence, putting forth an answer to the riddle of what happened in the Jerusalem Council and the sending of the apostles and the naming of them in the gospel lesson. But I want to say to you that it seems to me the heartbeat is actually right here, inside both of them, that takes into account both internal spirit-inspired order and missionary adventure that actually sees men and women come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that whenever a decision is made within the councils of the church that actually favors one out of balance with the other, there is always a certain level of chaotic, unintended consequences which wind up happening. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't do that sometimes. Are you there? I mean, sometimes we make decisions, we do the best that we can, we pray hard, and then there are other in unintended consequences, and you just pray that God cleanse and forgive and keep you on the right track, because you never know who's going to be offended or the thing that you didn't expect to happen actually will. Entropy is always among us, and we're constantly wrestling with an organization that is broken, and yet the organization that God has chosen to use to be a light to the nations of all things. So here we are, brothers and sisters. We're who we've got. I, here's where I want to actually try to spend my time. First of all, I continue to wrestle, as I mentioned to you earlier today, about the power dynamics that are going on inside of our church and how, in fact, in my opinion, it's extraordinarily detrimental to the gospel. Um, I, I found a quote, and it's not someone that you would expect me to quote, a woman named Jackie Hill Perry, uh, and she says this, have you ever been around a group of bored teenagers? They always end up bickering about something silly like who controls the remote, although that's actually not a very silly question. She says, I think American Christians are like that, and it actually speaks to our privilege. And what she means by that is that given that we live in the remaining vestiges of Christendom, we spend a lot of time around in-house arguments and not thinking particularly about their evangelistic implications. That was certainly my experience at the last general convention in our conversations about prayer book revision, that somehow if we just got the words differently, people would flock to us. <laughs> we well, see, you laugh, but I have to tell you, there really are bishops of all people who actually really believe that. All that we have to do is tweak it, and they're just going to come running. It is totally ludicrous. If you've spent any time at all with people who are on the outside of the church, it drives me to profanity to think about. <laughs> I, instead, what I want to say is, is that in the midst of that kind of trivia, which in fact can give us the impression of being very busy for the sake of the kingdom, that's its deception. There is actually a world that profoundly needs the miraculous power of God. Um, 
E.M. Bounds, perhaps Jackie Hill Perry's total opposite, Protestant devotional author. The past has not exalted the possibilities, nor the demands of being available for great things for God. The church that is dependent on its past for its miracles of power and grace is indeed a fallen church. The church that is dependent on its past for its miracles of power and grace is indeed a fallen church. So in the midst of the culture that we find ourselves in where everything has a trigger, where people are incredibly wary about who's going to offend whom, uh, the loudest voice claiming the marketplace, morals, language being upended, not just morals by any stretch of the imagination. How shall we now live? Some very brief comments. I thought it was actually quite prophetic, and it wasn't planned this way, that the, reading, the reader of the Acts lesson was Jared Jones. Uh, Jared, newly ordained to the priesthood, presently serving as chaplain at Holy Trinity Academy in Melbourne. One of the remarkable things about what's happening at Holy Trinity Academy, a very fine school, by the way, is that non-believing students are coming to faith. They are saying, you know, I don't go to church. This is my church. And they're coming to believe. And so conversations are happening about how to prepare young adults for baptism within the context of an Episcopal-affiliated school. And the only reason that sounds so astonishing is because it's so unusual. In any other context, well, of course, we're an Episcopal-affiliated institution, which means we believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're calling men and women to faith in Jesus Christ. And what is the appropriate response if they come to faith? To say, yes, Jesus is Lord, and to be baptized in the Trinity. That's normal life. It's not normal life in a school. And I rejoice in that. And the good news is that Byron, their head of school, I'm sorry, not Byron, just loves about the fact that this is, in fact, happening. Because, you see, in the midst of the craziness of our culture, there is room for men and women who are willing to live the words they pray, to quote the hymn that we just sang. Because it was to human beings. Did you notice that the promise, I have made you a light to the Gentiles, was appropriated by Peter in the Acts lesson. Just prior to the reading today, when they're debating about what to do with these Gentile believers, what do we do with them, Peter says, stands up and says, you chose me. In fact, God made a choice that I should be the one whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news. I have made you a light to the Gentiles was the verse that he quotes in the previous chapter. And God, who knows the human heart, testifies to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did us. So in other words, what are we going to do with that? Because after all, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus. It's not about the adherence to the law and that everybody gets quiet because they knew that <laughs> Peter told the truth. And then of all things, James stands up. I, I, this is remarkable to me. It causes me to ask questions for which I have no answers, which is what was going on in God working through James? What was happening in James's life that he would be so prepared in that moment to stand up and to offer literally the whole basis, literally even throughout history, of how we deal with questions, inter-questions, inter as we try to work out mission together. It wasn't just, as you know, the Jerusalem Council compromise. What happened here was a precedent was set that we're still wrestling with and reflecting on, particularly when we are in missionary situations for which we have no easy answers the capacity to think and wrestle together in a way that allows us to come out and say, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. 
and out of that to be able to make a decision that actually causes the object of those decisions to be glad because that's the end of the chapter. The end of the chapter is when the decision was made, we would encourage you to do these things and not those and we're going to live together. It says they rejoiced. That's the difference between a godly decision and a power control decision. Because a power control decision is committed to strictly maintaining the status quo in a way that actually penalizes the innovators. That didn't happen here. They rejoiced. And they rejoiced because they knew that tremendous generosity for which they did not deserve had been opened up for them in the willingness to allow them to, in fact, begin to walk away from the regimental call to behave according to the law of Moses. I don't know about you, but that just wants, I just want to sit down and ponder that for a while because it is, in fact, an extraordinary development. So I want to talk a little bit about the meaning of that decision and what that might mean for us. First of all, if we're going to make decisions in the midst of these sort of interregnum situations for which there is no easy answer, it requires of us the capacity to be able to see what it is that God is doing. We're not just coming up with something blind. We have already asked God to impart to us the capacity to, in essence, read the signs of the times, to listen with our ear to the ground, to understand as best we can what the Holy Spirit is actually doing in any given moment, to spend time with people both who agree as well as those who disagree with us, to listen to the voice of the Lord, to be willing to be humble enough to learn from people who are not like us and yet still name the name of Jesus that will allow us and even force us to challenge some of our own basic presuppositions. Peter and James were not prepared by their rabbinic instruction to come to the decision that they made today in this reading. They were not. And yet, they did. I mean, I, I just, I'm just shocked. But they made a decision that was, in fact, even though it was extraordinarily innovative, it was consistent and honored the past precedents of what it was that God had done. In other words, it's not like, okay, what we really need now are, let me just think, chartreuse vestments for Pentecost. <laughs> in other words, there has to be a connection in some way or another. There has to be that capacity to be able to tie the precedents of what God has done in the past and bring them into the present so that there is a lack of inconsistency even in the midst of innovation. That is not easy to be able to do. But unless you are willing to listen to the counsel of the elders and those who uphold for good reason the traditions that are in fact among us and honor their voice, you will never ever be an instrument of innovation. You'll be squashed like a bug. Or you'll just be treated as a kind of iconoclast who goes and starts his own little denomination. Who needs that? Secondly, in making a decision that is asking something new, the end result of that decision has to be that those who receive it rejoice. It is not an imposition of power. It is, in fact, a setting free. You see, the whole thrust of what Peter is commenting on is the fact that in the midst of all that God was doing, their goal was to be a light to the Gentiles. It was to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. James picks up the very same thing. Simeon related to us how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to do what? To take among them a people for his name. 
In other words, what is God doing? God is winning a people for his name among the Gentiles. And that's what we see God doing. Therefore, any decision that we have to make or are called to make has to, in fact, build upon that, allow it to expand and enhance. We're not interested in restricting the work of the Holy Spirit. We're actually wanting to do something that will enable that work to even move further. So in, in fact, to do so in such a way is that not only do the Gentiles rejoice but also so that other people may seek God as, as a result of what is in fact actually happening. In other words, the fruit of a decision that should be made by the people of God is that those who are called to faith in Christ rejoice and that the gospel is extended and more people say yes to Christ. In other words, if it's all just about in-house decisions around ordering what we need to do on the inside without the missionary implications of how more and more people might be invited to the gospel, then it's just inside baseball. And we're, you know, doing our thing while the rest of the world argues about who knows what. And there's no meeting. There is no, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Most of the decisions that are made within many of our councils, including our vestries, are really around who controls the remote. And as a result, people are not brought to faith in Christ. But we look like we're really busy. And we're doing a lot. Um, and in fact, this passage calls out that kind of behavior as doing nothing more than perpetuating our own, what? Our own irrelevance to the work of God? Our own genuine capacity to grieve the power of the Holy Spirit and his presence? Our willingness to maintain our institutions in a way that actually becomes a stumbling block to the community, to faith in Jesus Christ, our willingness to remain absent from the public square and to speak clearly to the issues of our day among people who hunger for a word of truth because we want to fight about what color there ought to be vestments at Pentecost? Do you not understand, my sisters and brothers, that our silence, or better yet, our capacity to remain strictly in conversation with each other, in fact, blunts the evangelistic possibilities that God wants to do through all of our churches. I, I grieve where we spend our time, not because those things are not important, but because they are not penultimately important. We look so good at what we do. And yet, where my heart goes, just again and again and again, is to the person who is looking to see if somebody, somebody is going to sit, listen, hear her heart, make room for what it is that she has to say, and allow it to become an invitation to know the one who is the healer of broken hearts the forgiver of sins. And particularly in our day where our reputation in, among so many is that we are known as a place where trauma happens. Trauma, not just internal division, but genuine physical, emotional assault. Who am I in the public square? You've heard me say, I could be a predator for what the general public might know. I mean, that's, the way, that's now where we stand among so many. Not just irrelevant, but in fact dangerous. Dangerous for personal health, dangerous to social progress, certainly, in a way that in fact makes it, it's, we have to sort of get on the other side of literally the assumed character to just begin to build a relationship. And I have to tell you, so long as we continue to remain silent in the face of those kinds of often tragically character, accurate characteristics, 
it will be even more difficult for us to speak up. In other words, the ground is sinking beneath our feet when it comes to our capacity to be able to speak into the public square. And the more silent we are, the more we affirm for that audience the fact that we are in fact irrelevant or worse, guilty as charged. And as a result, have nothing to say. Is it been so long ago that respected clergy were quoted in the news, their counsels were sought, and they became collaborators in a way that in fact promoted the common good, though in every generation there have been collaborators that have just been mere collaborators. What will we do? Sometimes it requires extraordinarily bold action. Um, the, the line, I loved it, that in the Isaiah lesson, with, in describing for the context about God bringing a new light to the Gentiles, the Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all nations. It's an extraordinarily powerful symbol. You know, big, huge, sinewy biceps right here with a sword in his hand. And there are times when the church acts in that way. Not long ago, I heard about a church up in Chicago that had amassed a serious amount of money, and it made the Chicago Tribune that they took that money and paid the medical bills of over 6,000 recipient citizens in Chicago. It was their Christmas gift to their community. It was a way of saying in a very clear way, we love you, and Jesus cares about even the smallest detail in your lives. That's bearing your arm. That's stepping out, getting into the spotlight, and making room for the outrageous. It is the sign and wonder that this generation needs, the miracles that stand out, that cause us to be the men and women that people, in fact, notice. That requires a huge amount of boldness and the capacity to try to think in ways that are not normal for us because we like to hide out and hope people are going to show up because we have nice music and pretty programs. And we do. I mean, we really do. But that's not going to win the world for Jesus. Stepping out into the square and beginning to connect to people who don't know faith, who have questions, to take the ridicule that comes with that, because it will, is a part of what generates the possibility of open faith. Other times, it's extraordinarily delicate, particularly when you're dealing with people for whom the church has been an agent of severe personal wounding. I, I, I felt, felt that in a kind of odd sort of metaphor today. I, when I put my cross in the suitcase, I wrap the chain so it goes like around this, and then I unravel it, and it almost becomes a devotional practice to unravel the chain of the cross before I put it around my neck. It's, it's a silver cross and it's pretty sturdy, but it, doesn't, it wouldn't take a lot just to snap it. And I, I certainly don't want to keep getting new ones. And so what's happened is that it is required of me that particularly when it gets in knots, which it does from time to time, to ply it apart very, very delicately. Honestly, I don't have a lot of patience for that. More often than not, what I do is, if Laura Lee's here, I say, you're really good at this, would you? <laughs> and she does. She has a great, you know, she, she's been a seamstress, so she knows exactly how to pull. Just, But she wasn't here. So it was my job to sit in my room and find a way to unravel that in a way that I could just put it on and get over here. But as I began to do it, I found myself praying because I know in dealing with some of the people who come into the life of our church, that kind of delicacy is precisely what they need. The right word said in the right tone, in the right context, in a way that becomes an instrument that the Lord uses to speak words of healing and kindness in the midst of trauma. And those men and those women are in your churches. 
If you don't know that, it's only because they haven't told you. None of us are immune. And if there isn't on your part and my part the delicate willingness to be gentle in those times and to ask God to show you with the eyes of faith who in your congregation never wants to look at you in the face. Who in your congregation is the one who is so extraordinarily busy because to just sit down and have a conversation would invite a level of disclosure that she would not want to do with you. Can she also not be one that rejoices and is glad? The witness of James the Just, this most extraordinary figure, is one that knew, in a sense, both power and delicacy, because both are available in the decision that he made. <sighs> Lift up your eyes. Say yes even more deeply to that to which you have been called. As a leader in your community, as a leader in your community, as a pastor to your people, and as an evangelist, to those who do not yet know, a priest, a deacon. If you want to just play with the remote, you can. But I assure you God will raise up other churches. He will. He does what he desires for the glory of his own name. But the past has not exhausted the possibilities nor the demands of doing some great things for God. The church that is dependent on its past for its miracles of power and grace is indeed a fallen church. May it not be, but may us give thanks for James the Just who taught us right here the very basis of Anglicanism and the power that we have to offer to the culture a church that is willing to live with it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us, even if we don't always have a proof text, and find a way to live and witness together that the Gentiles, whomever they are, might rejoice. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing. Dear friends, the ministry we share is none other than the sacrificial ministry of Christ 
who gave himself up to death on the cross for the salvation of the world. By his glorious resurrection, he has opened for us the way of everlasting life. By the gift of the Holy Spirit, he shares with us the riches of his grace. We are called to proclaim his death and resurrection, to administer the sacraments of the new covenant, which he sealed with his blood on the cross, and to care for his people in the power of the Spirit. Do you hear in the presence of Christ and his church renew your commitment to your ministry under the pastoral direction of your bishop? I do. Do you reaffirm your promise to give yourself to prayer and study? I do. Do you reaffirm your promise so to minister the word of God and the sacraments of the new covenant that the reconciling love of Christ may be known and received? Do you reaffirm your promise to be a faithful servant of all those committed to your care, patterning your life in accordance with the teachings of Christ so that you may be a wholesome example to your people? I do. And now, as your bishop, I too, before God and you, rededicate and reaffirm the promises that I made when I was ordained, I ask your prayers, a moment of silence. In this moment of silence, I would urge you that if the Holy Spirit has been prompting you in any particular way to be more bold in your ministry, that you would say yes to that boldness. I would urge you in the silence as there is a moment or a place where God is calling you to renounce sin and to give up a secret way that you so renounce it as inconsistent with your calling and what God has done in you in Christ Jesus. Finally, I would urge you to speak the truth in love and to allow the work of the Holy Spirit to so break, reform, and renew that you are known among all as a servant first and foremost of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we say together, may the Lord who has given us the will to do these things Give us also grace and power to perform them. And now for the blessing of the oils. Dear friends in Christ, in the beginning, the Spirit of God hovered over the creation. And throughout history, God, by the gift of the Holy Spirit, has empowered his people to serve him. As a sign of this gift, the priests and kings of Israel were anointed with oil, and our Lord Jesus was himself anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism as the Christ, God's own Messiah. At baptism, Christians are likewise anointed by that same Spirit to empower them for God's service. Let us now set apart this oil for it to be of the sign of that anointing. Let us pray. Eternal Father, whose blessed Son was anointed by the Holy Spirit to be the Savior and Sermon of all, we pray you to consecrate this oil, that those who are sealed with it may share in the royal priesthood of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oil of unction. It has been the custom of the church to attend to the sick in the name of the Lord Christ and to ask God's miracle of healing for those so afflicted, praying for them and anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. Let us now set apart this oil to be the sign of that anointing for healing. Let us pray. O Lord, Holy Father, giver of health and salvation, send your Holy Spirit to sanctify this oil, that as your holy apostle anointed many that were sick and healed them, so may those who in faith and repentance receive this holy unction be made whole. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. 
And finally, the oil of consecration. The church teaches that all things in the creation are gifts from Almighty God and that they should all be seen as special objects used for good. From time to time, the church set apart special objects to be used for a holy purpose in the worship and service of God, blessing and anointing those objects. Let us now set apart this oil to be the sign of sanctification for those things. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift you have given us in your love. We thank you for life itself and for the sacramental life that gives its fuller meaning. Bless, we pray you, this oil, that those things which are anointed with it may be set apart for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift you have given us in your love. We thank you for life itself and for the sacramental life that gives its fuller meaning. Sorry, I already prayed this prayer. I'm going to do it anyway. Bless, we pray you, these oils, that those things which we anoint with it may be set apart for your service. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you.